Hi, welcome folks. Thank you so much for joining us. Good to see you all. We're just trickling into the room a little bit. And I hope that you all are making this a comfortable space for yourself, grabbing your water, your snacks, whatever you need to make this a good environment for you. Um, we're really happy that you're with us. And I um, would also love to connect with all of you in the chat um, or off mute. Um, feel free to, to unmute your mic or to type into the chat and let us know who you are, what's your name. You can share pronouns if you'd like to. What do you teach? Uh, what's your role as an educator? And where are you coming from today? We're going to be doing a fair bit of talking to each other today, so we'll um, we'll get started using that, like warm up our, our Zoom muscles a little bit, get started in the chat here. Hi, Essie in Madison, Wisconsin. Um, I suppose I should also introduce myself. My name is Hannah, uh, they, them pronouns. Um, I am an educator at the Pulitzer Center, and I live in Washington, D.C. Janelle, would you like to introduce yourself, too? Hi hey everybody, I'm Janelle Bentz and I teach English 1 honors uh, to ninth graders. I am at an all PBL campus um, in Coppell, Texas, which is outside of DFW. Happy to be here today. Amazing. Thank you so much, Janelle. I'm excited to be here across all this space and time. Hello. Um, Wow. Hello to uh, Miguel in Cambodia. Thank you for joining us at 4 a.m. your time. Really appreciate you um, being here uh, in the very, very early morning or late night, however you perceive of time. <laughs> Hello in Belgium. More folks in Wisconsin. A good contingent emerging here. Hi, Naomi. <laughs> Hello in New Jersey. Thank you folks so much for being with us today. We are really excited um, to, uh, to have you with us. This is honestly my favorite room in the world to be in. Um, I have facilitated several hundred Fighting Words workshops for students over the course of the last seven years now. Um, and it is one of my absolute favorite things to do, one of my very favorite projects. Um, and I'm really excited to be able to share it with you all today. Um, a reminder uh, that today we are in a Zoom meeting, not a Zoom webinar, as we so often are in um, professional developments that I've been a part of lately. So if you are able to be on camera today, we'd love to see you um, and appreciate those of you who already are. We also totally understand that there may be plenty of reasons why you're not able to join us on camera, and that is fine, too. Uh, but we will have questions for you today. And however you're able to engage with us, um, we would love to hear from you aloud. You can raise your hand or just pop off mute. Uh, we're a small enough group that that should be fine today. Um, and you can also use the chat to share responses to questions in writing. Um, please feel free to not only share responses to the questions that Janelle and I might be asking you, but also to share um, to share uh, your thoughts, your ideas, and maybe resources that you might recommend with other participants in this space. We are all educators and learners together as we're thinking about global issues, poetry, and journalism in the classroom. Um, reminder too, uh, you're welcome to use like those fun reactions um, to show agreement, show care for each other. Um, this is a workshop space, so uh, we want to keep it a, um, a positive, generative environment. But um, as I say that it is a workshop space, um, don't worry, we're also not going to be writing opuses in this, uh, in this short hour and 15 minutes that we have together. Our goals instead are going to be thinking about um, how we can use the Fighting Words program 
to, uh, to answer some of the learning goals that you might be working on already in your classrooms. So this is our agenda, what we're gonna be working through today. We're gonna start with some introduction on why we might use this project in the first place and how it might speak to some of the things that you and your students are already thinking about. We'll share some resources with you and what's available to help guide your students through this process. Um, and we'll get to hear from an educator who has worked with students on this project for the last couple of years. Thank you, Janelle, so much for being with us. Um, and uh, four of her students, is four the right number, um, have, been, uh, have been contest finalists over the last couple of years. Um, they are amazing. We have links to all of their work for you to check out. After that, um, a lot of our workshop today is going to be um, an interactive poetry workshop to model for you what this can look like when you do it with your students and um, to evaluate uh, some of the student work that's come out of this contest in previous years. So we're gonna get to do some like digging into uh, news stories and global issues and um, most excitingly to me to some of those student poems that have been written in previous years. So, Let's go ahead and get started. Um, these are the main essential questions that are gonna guide us today. What is the value of global issues journalism in the classroom? How can we navigate our personal emotional responses to the news and support our students in doing that work? And how can the Fighting Words Poetry Contest specifically be used to empower your students as close readers and as global change makers? And we'll talk about what that can look like and what that means for this project. This contest is something that the Pulitzer Center has run over the course of the last seven years. And the Pulitzer Center is, broadly speaking, a journalism organization. We support journalists with grants to tell many different kinds of global stories. And our overall mission is to champion the power of stories to make complex issues relevant and inspire action. These are the five kind of focus areas that we work with. Um, and you'll see they're pretty broad. So they include a lot of other things underneath those bigger umbrellas. Um, but I'd like to ask you to do a little bit of thinking about how these might or might not resonate with your own students. So I'm gonna launch a poll real quick. Hopefully you can see that. <laughs> um, it should ask you, uh, what kinds of global issues do you think your students are most interested in? Um, and uh, please feel free to come off mute as well and share more detail about um, the kinds of issues that you're hearing your students talk about these days, um, what seems to be on their mind the most, whether it's something that you see on the screen or something different. I see those poll answers coming in. Anybody want to share um, off mute? Uh, any thoughts about what your students are thinking about these days? Um, big global issues or news stories that have been on their minds lately? Hi. Hi, Petra. Hi, uh, Reverend Petra. Yeah, I'm a community minister. Um, and an educator, lifelong educator, my role in this may be a little bit different in that um, I'm writing um, in a poetic form um, different aspects of history regarding the Ramapo um, nation. And, you know, this is a way to capture oral history um, and so it's a project that I'm working on in order to be able to gain some traction as I'm listening to elders and hearing their stories and um, putting it into this form so that, you know, we preserve history. I think for many indigenous um, nations, communities, so much history is lost, erased, um, and certainly history matters. History of peoples matter, capturing that and um, honoring that. And so that's a goal. And um, I just saw this email come up with this opportunity and it was like, 
and it's today and I have time. And so let's do this. So that's what that's about. Richard, thank you so much for sharing that with us and for being with us today. Um, really happy to have a poet in the room. Um, and um, and yeah, I'm, I'm hearing a lot of resonance with some of uh, the human rights issues that might be um, might be encompassed in some of those like land rights questions, racial justice questions. Well, um, so that might be in, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, absolutely, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. Welcome. And for, for folks who aren't able to share off mute, I hope it's okay if I read your message aloud. Um, thank you, Miguel. Uh, Miguel says, um, for me, the interests are focused mostly on environment as I organized ex exhibitions here in Southeast Asia on the topic in collaboration with Pulitzer. Thank you so much for that. Um, and human rights as Cambodia is a dictatorship and speech is heavily monitored. So poetry can be a way to talk about important issues in a safe manner and avoid the government. Thank you so much for bringing that perspective into the room um, and uh, a really important way for us to think about not only what kinds of issues we can elevate, but also what the utility of poetry as a medium in this space can be um, and why we might start with the journalism and the facts, but gravitate toward a different mode of expression um, for, uh, for many different reasons. Thank you folks for sharing. Um, and I'll go ahead and share the results from our poll as well. I'm seeing um, a lot of folks resonating with human rights issues, peace and conflict, climate and environment issues, um, and uh, excited to see that here. Um, hopefully something that your students will notice um, or folks who you're working with on uh, this, this project is that generally speaking, there are multiple people who are interested about in different um, issue areas that they're focusing on, um, which means that they're not alone with their interests and that there are people they can partner with when they think about making change, um, whether that's just thinking through these issues more deeply, seeing how they affect many different people, getting more perspectives on them, or whether it's about um, actually banding together and taking action on them and their communities. So this contest can be a gateway in a lot of different uh, capacities. It is about close reading. It is about the writing process and, um, and about analytical skills, but it's also about really investing in global issues, understanding solidarity and how we can think about ourselves as connected with other communities around the world and where that might lead us beyond the scope of our poems as well. So why do we do this work in the first place um, at the Pulitzer Center? Uh, as a journalism organization, why would we run a poetry contest? So we know from data, um, and this is uh, from the Common Sense uh, Media Survey of Young People um, from, uh, from 2017, um, should have a new one out soon, uh, that students say they feel more knowledgeable and more prepared to engage actively in their communities when they're following the news, but the news does not necessarily always live up to the kinds of ideals uh, that they might have for what it should look like. So for one thing, we have emotional responses when we're looking at news media. And I wonder how many of us might resonate with some of the things that students are saying about um, how news makes them feel. Uh, we're seeing large numbers of students saying that news makes them feel sad or depressed, angry or afraid. Um, so we wanna think about how to process those emotions. And on the other side, we're also seeing that, that, um, that students are telling us that news doesn't seem to know what their lives are really like. They don't feel like their communities are well represented. It can be complicated and hard to follow. And it doesn't seem to be covering the issues that are most important to them. So part of what we want to do um, on the Pulitzer Center side is to bridge the gap between those two things what news can be and what students ideally want it to be, a tool of empowerment to feel smart, knowledgeable, and equipped to take action in their communities, and all of those other things that are barriers to actually doing so. So with that in mind, um, we hope to create resources like this contest that can cultivate curiosity, um, information and knowledge, empathy and engagement uh, by connecting students with those underreported global news stories. And we believe that people in communities who actively engage with these systemic challenges that they'll find in those news stories are going to be able to find solutions to those problems together. 
So um, through fighting words, what we hope students will be able to do is explore a few different forms of writing, um, understanding journalism as one form of writing and um, poetry as another that both use information um, and uh, emotion to convey the global issues that are important to us. And we hope that these will help us to understand the roots and impacts of the different global issues that students are most passionate about and make their own stories as well as those of people who are most affected by these issues heard. So I wanna share um, just a few basic resources on the contest um, that you can use for yourselves um, or if you are working with uh, classes of students to help guide them through this process. There are very few rules associated with the Fighting Words contest. We're really interested in seeing what students do with a, a few parameters. All that, that's required here is that students choose one Pulitzer Center news story um, from the last 15 years. So they have thousands at their disposal from many, many different news sources and use lines from that Pulitzer Center story to respond to a global issue of their choice. Um, we're gonna spend time in a workshop together today looking at how they can actually do that, moving from I'm interested in this broad topic to creating a poem that, um, that expresses a really specific perspective and story. There are prizes for these poems. Everyone who's published on the Pulitzer Center website as a winner or finalist receives a cash prize. Um, and all of the poets who participate in the contest are also invited to one of my personal favorite events of the year, which is an international open mic um, for, uh, for students uh, to share their work with each other. Um, that, uh, that usually happens just after the contest deadline in mid-May. Uh, students have until Monday, May 12th to submit their work. So there's, there's, a, there's a good window of time for them to go ahead and get started with this. Um, and, uh, and we have all of the details and resources for the contest available at this link, which I'll probably just keep dropping into the chat a fair bit over the course of our workshop today, um, directing to different uh, pieces of that website. Uh, things that you can find at that contest portal, which exists both in English and in Spanish, um, include obviously the contest guidelines and entry forms, but um, also scaffolded graphic organizers for different grade levels that try to guide students through um, reflection questions and uh, model poem, example poem analysis of previous contest winners, writing worksheets to get them started with note taking on the story that they choose and uh, crafting the poem ultimately. Um, and uh, really importantly, um, the peer review process, right? Um, revision is so key to uh, the work that they're gonna be doing, thinking critically about what they produce and uh, making sure that there's a lot of intentionality behind the way that they're representing the issue and the story that they've chosen. There are also slide presentations for educators who might want to facilitate workshops in their classrooms themselves, uh, curated stories um, that students can explore for different grade levels, and uh, we're also offering options to schedule guest workshops um, with uh, Pulitzer Center staff members um, for uh, for larger groups of students uh, for um, for like kind of assembly style groups of students this year of um, over seventy or more. Perhaps the best resource that's available on the site is really just the students' poems themselves. Um, if, uh, if students are uh, taking a look at previous contest winners, it'll be both an inspiration, um, understanding what it can look like for their peers to do this work, and, um, and also can, uh, can give them some great ideas for how people with many different voices and interests come together um, to, uh, to make their voices heard about the issues that they really care about. How can students find a story for their poem? Um, there are a couple of different ways uh, that serve different goals for your classroom, depending on um, what you are working on. Um, because we have folks participate in this contest who are science teachers, who are social studies teachers, as well as English language arts. Um, so uh, this is an example of, um, of the curated stories that exist on our website. Uh, we have a portal where students can think about the global issues that they're interested in. If they're interested in human rights, they can navigate to those stories. And you'll find um, that they're sorted by different grade levels where they can explore something um, as well as uh, with the content warnings that, um, that go with them so that they're a little bit more prepared uh, for what they might encounter here. 
This is probably the best option if you're trying to do this workshop on a timeline in your classroom or for yourself. Um, but it's also not intended to limit folks um, because they can select any story on the website for their poems ultimately. And uh, doing this means that they have a lot more options and also that you have an opportunity to engage in some media literacy education around the contest as well, um, practice research skills, things like that too. Uh, so if students go to the full Pulitzer Center archive, they can still sort by issues, but they're gonna see many, many more stories, many different kinds of news sources. And they also won't come with the same kinds of content warnings and things like that because we publish them uh, directly from the news outlets. Um, Pulitzer is not a news outlet. Instead, we work with many hundreds of outlets around the globe with their own practices around those kinds of things. So it's a little bit less consistent on that front. Um, but it is an opportunity for students to be able to find something that is most in tune with their interests and um, also to learn some of those skills for navigating information um, on a website that was uh, designed for um, many different kinds of engagement. I'm just checking the chat real quick because I think we might have a question or a comment. Ah, that's awesome. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, the poetry of previous winners is what got our students engaged in the contest. I love that. So um, we've shared a few of the resources that exist on our website um, that we've developed for educators, but um, likely every educator in the room knows that <laughs> what you actually put into practice in the classroom is probably gonna be adapted for the different things um, that, uh, that you're trying to do with your students that are most exciting to you um, and uh, that work best for your students. So I am really grateful to Janelle for being here today to talk with us a little bit more about why she has done this contest in previous years, what it has looked like to walk her students through that process and um, share some tips with all of us for, um, for how we can do it too. So I wanted to share as well alongside uh, your face, Janelle, um, a few of the wonderful students who have won this contest in previous years. And just so folks know, you'll get this slide presentation afterward and um, all of them are linked with the students' poems. So I hope you'll check that out and hear their voices too. Um, but Janelle, I am going to stop sharing my screen for a moment, and um, I would love to hear from you um, a little bit more about uh, how you started with the Fighting Words contest, how it kind of fits in with some of your learning goals, and, um, and, uh, and then we'll talk a little bit more about the process that, uh, that you've shared um, around your teaching. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, First of all, I love the contest. It's a wonderful resource because it fits right into my philosophy as an educator. Um, I am very civic minded and I find that kids, teenagers in particular, that's the time when they're really beginning to get a grasp of what their opinions and hopefully educated opinions are on very important issues. Um, sometimes in ninth grade, it may be their first or for some of them, it may be, you know, maybe they've always been really intrigued by um, civic issues or global issues. Um, but this is the time when they feel like they can maybe break away basically from what their parents or their family members feel. So it's a time to really explore, but also engage them. So for me, like our guiding, our year long guiding question is how can each of us leave a legacy of light? And when we start the year with that idea, of course, we explore where, where there may be sources of light, both personally and from, you know, our community, our outside, our global community, where is that light? But then also the discussion turns to darkness as well. And I will say that we have, it's my favorite project um, prior to this, that as groups, we have we, what we call it's... Um, it's slamming for a cause and it's about bringing action to words. So in November, December, we are exploring human rights issues and as groups, they create and perform in a slam poem that is actually a whole event they end up hosting and they pick a nonprofit as a class and all the money goes to that nonprofit. So they are seeing that they're speaking up for about a cause that they choose as a group, which is wonderful. 
um, and they have to compete to perform, but they're also seeing that their words make a difference because as they host the event, they create um, t-shirts and sell them. And anyway, they can see all of the wonderful impacts that they have from their words. For example, this year they rose, raised over $15,000 for their chosen charity. And every year it's a big thing because this is the first time they're really seeing a strong connection for some of them of what their education is doing and how it interacts with the real world. And they're making a difference and it's through poetry. So when this came along, I was like, oh, this is awesome because a lot of my poets said, well, what if we want to write alone? And I said, okay. So this came along and it was perfect. So um, I just thought I'd provide that background that my kids have done poetry before, which is excellent. Um, but this was kind of a different interaction because they really had to depend on their own devices, let's say. So I actually created, I'm going to try to share screen. <laughs> I actually created um, a, an outline of what my activities look like. Yeah, it's not, it's not working. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Hannah. Can you do it for me? I'm so sorry. <laughs> okay. No worries. Um, <laughs> and it's just how it works in my classroom. Um, so there's a Google Doc, and I would be happy to share the link to you, but this takes you through step-by-step step of how I go through the unit. This, this, the Fighting Words contest is part of the year-long project, but it's also run side-by-side. Side. Right now we're doing for Earth's Sake and Earth Day um, project. So what we would start with is we'd return back to the year long driving question and we would look, okay, well, where are some, we found that source of light through our poetry and we're going to continue to explore that individually. And we're going to look through some articles to see what we're interested in and see, you know, write about it. So my first, and you can see on this document, in each square, it's linked to like a specific activity or lesson. So the first thing I do is really allow them to explore the site and look at the contest, the invitation to compete in the contest. And I have them look at the poems written by, they would be sophomores or juniors now, um, written by previous winners um, from our school, which is super empowering because sometimes you look at a contest and you say, eh, I can't do that. But now that I've been fortunate enough to work with such great kids who really put their heart into it and have been able to be finalists for them. They're like, Oh, I know that person. And it really just sparks the fire. So the first thing I do is just have them look at it. What has stood out for them. It's really brief. Like, let's look at this. Let's see what it's about. What do we need to have included? Um, and it's just the basic, like, okay, do you know that you're supposed to include some lines from the articles? Do you know that you get to choose the article? and when the submission is. So that's their big first dip in the toe and in the water. And then we look at the Pulitzer story choices. That one takes long. And this is another one too, that I would introduce and say, hi, <laughs> hi y'all. Let's take five minutes and let you peruse. Here's the filters. You know what you're interested in. Um, the interesting thing is too, what I love and you saw as she was scanning through, there are different articles that may be in different languages, which is important, especially because I have a lot of um, emergent bilinguals. And so perhaps they can find one that's going to be easier to understand, especially if it has video or audio with it, but also some that may be written in languages. So I really appreciate that my kids who are still learning English, they can not only find an issue that may be closer to where they're from, but also there's a language support that's already built in. So more of my kids have access um, to this activity. Just by making it their choice is a huge um, benefit for my kids. They, we have, you know, a very diverse in cultures um, in very many different ways across my, cause I teach all of the ninth graders cause we're a small school. So across my 90 to hundred kids, it can be very um, diverse. And now they're able to pick topics that they weren't able to explore previously. So that notion of having so many articles, not only written about different topics, but written in different perspectives is crucial to my kids because they immediately find a topic that they're, well, not immediately, when they find a topic that they're interested in, they can find articles that present different perspectives. And that feeds their thinking and feeds their writing in terms of, 
I should offer different perspectives or what does it look like for this person? And that's really important for them to be really critical consumers of journalism, of media, and really gaining a knowledgeable um, opinion of what's happening. So they look at it and then they have to complete a form of the stories that they're um, that they are going to choose. Um, and that just puts in my mind too what they're looking at. I have to say it's interesting because the stories are so specific um, where they see what the specific, like the article gives them a little, like you're zooming in. In this big problem that they're interested in, it gives them a really one piece to examine and it kind of makes the global issue come more to life for them. Um, the next thing I do is as they're reading their article and they, ha they look around and they find more out about it, they do a check-in with their research partner and they just say, hey, you know, what was happening in your article? What do you know about it? Tell me more about it. And they just literally talk about it. And that's to really gauge whether or not they're understanding or misunderstanding what's happening with the article. And it gives the poets um, an opportunity to learn more about a different issue too, which is great. So that's a, the next activity. And then further down, I have this, this process works for me, but it's a writing process of exactly how we go from research to writing a poem. So once they have their research done, I have them do a mind map, which I call a brain dump, and they write down everything that they remember from the poem. Um, and we'll start with just like maybe some facts, maybe some places, and then we'll dig deeper and say, well, what images do you remember? And they'll write it down. And I invite them also to look at pictures of where those things happen and they write down um, imagery and things like that on their brain dump. And from the brain dump, I ask them to do like quick free writes um, of just like pick, they pick like um, two or three things that are on their brain dump just to write about. And then that gets them starting the writing process. From what they write, um, they share what they've written with their group and the group's like, ooh, I really like that. Ooh, I really like that. And so then they have an option. They circle it or highlight it. They do another write. And they, I call it exploding, exploding that moment. So they can do another, um, and I caught the things that they circle hotspots. They do another writing just on that hotspot to explode it. Um, and that continues. So you can see they can keep going on and on like, okay. And as they go through basic certain hotspots, they naturally find the organization of where stances should fit. Anyway, so this is, and they continue. So then after they go through the writing process, I have another um, check-in, oh, oh, sorry, I make them submit the brain, photo of their brain dump. And then they have poetry checkpoints. And that's also where they get in their groups and they read out, okay, this is what I have. They can go through that writing process again of hot spots, whatever. They could check for devices. They can see if there's a clear point of view, or maybe they're asking for another point of view, or, you know, does it, does it really flow the way, um, like the poem and rhythm of poetry usually has that people have in their head? And they continue just to give feedback. So they can go through these checkpoints and the rounds of feedback for however many stanzas they have, however long, because um, some people like short poems and other people really like to make it a little bit longer. Um, but by the end of going through the checkpoints and getting that feedback, they rarely ask me for feedback at that point because I'm like, oh, this is good. This is great because they've already vetted it with and gotten feedback from different learners. And then they submit. That's what I have. <laughs> they also do love to actually record it as well because they've had that slam poem, that poetry performance spoken word performance um, experience in their, in their back pocket. So they like to perform it as well. So they do choose to re uh, record. And I apologize if that's too fast, but. No, no, that's, that's great. And I love <laughs> how clear that outline is in that document. You provide a lot of really helpful, like scaffolding for the writing process specifically in right. here that goes beyond anything you're going to find on the Pulitzer Center site. So um, if it's okay with you for us to share out this resource, would love to. Yeah, I mean that. that it just really, it really worked for us to like go into, and I find the kids, which is so awesome. Like if they're stuck, they'll go back to do another brain dump and they'll, and it doesn't have to be so general. Like at that point you could say, let's talk about why it's happening. Do a brain dump of that. Find your hotspot, write about it, crack it open, you know, explode that moment. 
see what else you can do. From there, another option that they do, because sometimes they're too verbose, I do, let's do blackout. So give me your, <laughs> let's, let's look at the poem. Uh, have your partner black out what they don't need. And then it's also magic. So it offers like variations of lines and things like that. So. Yeah. I'm still, um, I'm still thinking about what you shared about the, um, the stories being a good way of zeroing in um, and making mm -hmm. in some ways the global issue that they might have chosen more real. Um, students come to this with such different mindsets. Um, some students come to the contest knowing I have a real passion around this issue. Um, it, it It is directly affecting my life. I can point to specific things around me in my community um, that I want to see change uh, that are related to this global issue. Others are really exploring um, and uh, might not know what they're interested in yet. Um, so I think it's it's a very cool framework um, for, for thinking about uh, how students might be able to, to access different kinds of stories depending on where they're at. Um, but Janelle, I wanted to ask you a little bit more about like your students' experiences. Um, from what you've heard from them, from what you know, what is their experience with this contest like? What kinds of like challenges do they tend to run into with it? What is exciting to them? And like, what has the impact of the contest been uh, in your classroom? Right. So they, I will say for those, the first few times that we've done it, we've probably done it only with three weeks. So they've always been like, I need more time. I'm like, okay, <laughs> yes. So um, I'm going to start it earlier this time and <laughs> give them more time. That was their frustration. But that just meant that they wanted more time to explore. They love the feedback um, because as everyone is sharing that vulnerability of like, here, this is my writing, like this is something I created. They know to give respectful feedback, but they also know to be honest that, you know, well, that wasn't, that wasn't the strongest. What if you did this or have you considered? And it's really is about knowing like devices and the poetry that in your mind, you think you kind of want to um, create. Does that make sense? So looking at the examples that you've already linked to, um, not just in my cl previous classes, but to all the others really gives them an idea of what all of the options are. Um, they appreciated having those access to examples. They're always asking for access to examples. They really like you being able to use lines that are lifted from the poems. Um, their feedback is like, what can I do from two? I was like, oh, let's, let's just do one for right now. Um, but I don't, I think it's a great idea for you to offer that point of view because that indicates that you're trying to find a fuller picture and that's really what we want. And if you can, push further than what your perspective is as a teenager in the United States right now. Like what, what else can you add? And so I'm happy that you're trying to do that, the research, looking at other articles. Um, but that is one of the things I'm like, I want to use more. I was like, okay, well, like right now, I think it just says one, one article. So um, they really enjoy it. They can't believe that. Well, okay. My biggest comment is probably that the, you guys care about what they have to say and that whenever they can share their voice, they will try, but it's exciting to see a huge organization like Pulitzer say that our words do matter and that we can't make a difference with our words and that you are all are paying attention. I think that's one of the things is that we need to allow everyone to be heard. And poetry for my kids has been a real way for them to discover their voices at the ninth grade level. And once they discover their voices, the changes that you see in the kids, the engagement, the confidence, and then uncovering like, oh, I'm really interested in this. And it's important because some people think of poetry as being like, eh. but they're saying no poetry is important because they understand that the poetry that they're interested in is not necessarily, you know, the sonnets and things like that, but it is poetry based on what's happening around them. Did that answer all your questions? Struggles? Yes, and I'm more maybe. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, no problem. Yeah, Thank that's you. amazing. And, you know, my, my last question for you is um, just like sort of what your top tip for educators who want to do this in their classrooms might be. I feel like you've already shared a lot with us that could be, you know, that we can extrapolate from that, that like we could apply mm -hmm. a lot of this. Um, but 
what do you tell yourself like when you're starting this project out um or what do you think others need to know as they're going into it even though we all know poetry is super difficult they don't think so um so for me i feel like the kids almost try poetry cuz they're like oh it's easier than the other writing but they are able to do the other writing as well because in poetry, their ideas have to be so succinct and so compact and they have to. I also tell them that good narrative writing or good expository writing has that beautiful narrative quality that you get from poetry. So it all works together. So if you think as an educator that, oh, all this poetry, it's like a waste of time because like they're not going to be, for me, they're not going to be tested on poetry. Yeah, I get it. But the other writing skills and research skills and comprehension skills um, build from this. So let them do it because they love it. <laughs> and because they create such beautiful things. <laughs> um, yeah. It's honestly like such a joy. Um, it, this is not why we run the contest, but it, it's just like one of my favorite parts of the year every year <laughs> to get to read like a thousand amazing poems from across the world. Um, and uh, truly like the amount of passion that goes into these poems and um, the the difference, like the diversity of voices um, that, that students are developing um, at this age. Yeah, I think that too, that since the there are so many articles that are written from different places and in different languages, that I thought that was cool last year to see the freeing of, well, I'm going to use my language too. I thought that mm. was really powerful. And again, let them feel seen, right? So... Was yeah, I think two of um, two of your students who are who have um, been finalists for the contest uh, used um, used multiple languages in their poems. So just so folks know, um, we guarantee that there will be Spanish language and English language fluency on the judging mm -hmm. team. But um, we also encourage multilingual poem poetry outside of that. Um, really, like multilingual poems, um, even when you cannot read, um, are not familiar with mm -hmm. one of the language, like can speak um, and uh, and can communicate like so much. Um, so strongly encourage students to use their own voices, whatever that means for them. And uh, it may well mean um, using multilingual work too. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, I'm curious, before we transition into the next portion of our time together, which is going to be the workshop portion, um, do folks have any questions uh, for Janelle or for like us on the Pulitzer Center side about the contest, about like the instructional methods, the pedagogy behind this? Um, any questions for Janelle or me? Gonna hold that for a second because I know we have some folks who um, can't come off mute. Otherwise, we'll move into our workshop. I have a question. Please, Amy. Um, so I apologize that I wasn't here at the beginning. So I don't know how you describe your your role. Um, but I, when I was looking at the doc that you had screen shared, it looked as though like the pacing of the time was pretty well thought out. So at some point you had like one minute for and two minutes for, um, and I'm just wondering, is that like kind of how you run your lit classroom in general? Um, or is this just something that you do? It seems like a really good way to pace things for us. Yeah, for it is. I am not really that scheduled, but for just the pre-writing, if I, if they know there's a limit to it, it's kind of like a safety thing. Like if I say, okay, you're just going to have to write for five minutes without talking. You guys can do that, right? It just is like a sort of comfort thing and it gives them enough to actually go ahead and look at and explore and analyze and find something else. Um, but yeah, the being quiet part is probably the hardest part for them. But as you're being quiet, you're respectfully, you know, listening, um, and allowing yourself to really be free with it. So. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, thank you for your question, Amy. Any others?
If we're feeling good now, um, reminder, you can always hop into the chat or put your hand up and let us know if you have another question and we can return to it. But um, I am excited for us to go ahead and get started on the next part of our workshop together, which is our workshop. Um, well, I mean, it's all a workshop, but um, it's our interactive uh, model workshop for what it can look like to, um, to dig into a fighting words poem in your classroom and introduce this contest to students. So um, where we are about to head is uh, into some texts. Um, we'll spend some time first in a short excerpt of a much longer news story. Um, we're only going to look about, at about like three or four paragraphs of a long form journalism piece. Uh, we'll take a look at that and then we'll look at a poem written by one of the three students on your screen in response to that news story. All of these students are past contest winners and finalists, um, and uh, they're among, you know, the, the many dozens of wonderful poems that you can find on the website. Uh, so I want to ask you the same question that I would always ask students um, if we were doing this workshop together, uh, because this workshop is really all about following your interests, identifying your passions, and, um, and figuring out how global issues connect to you. So um, question for you all, which of these topics would you most like to explore together in our remaining time? We can look at uh, Jamar Jackson's poem, which is about gun violence. We can look at um, Charlie's poem, which is about climate change and youth activism. Or we can look at Taylor Jamie Yarns's poem, which is about the effect of parents' incarceration on children. I see those votes coming in. We're at 62% now. I'm going to give it a couple seconds. Oh, no. <laughs> Bad news, we have a tie. <laughs> um, okay, so we have a tie between the poem on um, gun violence and the one on climate change and youth activism. Um, I, uh, I'm i sorry to put this on you, but Janelle, can I ask you to be the deciding vote? <laughs> As a co-host, I think you you probably can't vote, right? Um, I'm... I mean, I'm going to do climate change because I'm in the middle of a Earth Day project, so <laughs> it would help. Me. There we go. Let's do it. Um, if you wanted to explore the other uh, choice on this list, um, they are all going to be in this uh, slideshow. Um, all of them are embedded here, so you're more than welcome to check them out after this. And I really hope that you will because they're all fabulous poems. But um, I have a request for you, whether you're on your computer and want to open up a new window or if you're feeling old school today and have a pen and paper next to you. Um, we are first going to take a look at, again, that short excerpt of the news story. Same thing that I would ask students to do if we were doing an introductory workshop together, just to get a little bit of practice for how we might be noticing the words and phrases in a news story that could be useful for building out a word bank to ultimately write a poem. We are going to work on writing down at least one phrase that stands out to you in the text that we explore next. And that phrase can be something that stands out for, to you for like any reason. It might be about information. Maybe it has a fact, a number, a piece of data that you think others should know. Maybe it's about emotion. Maybe those words particularly capture how the story makes you feel or how it seems to be like making the people in the story, the subjects of the story feel. Or maybe there's just a linguistic interest factor here. Maybe there's a really powerful image going on in the in this phrase. Um, maybe the words make music. They have a sound um, that you want to note down. And don't feel the need to censor yourself on this. Feel free to write down more than, um, than, than one phrase, more than you think that you need, because ultimately, as with all writing, this is a revision process. Um, and, uh, and we want to have as much material as we think we can use to begin with. So I'm going to skip ahead um, to the climate change and youth activism story. And this story is called Young Climate Activists Warn Their Elders, Stop Destroying the Planet. Um, much longer story. It's a great read if you have time to explore it on our website um, later on. It's an LA Times story by several different journalists who collaborated on it. So I'm going to begin by reading our first paragraph um, aloud for us here. 
Uh, if anyone is willing to read aloud today, I would love to include more voices um, in, in our room. So please write your name in the chat or raise your Zoom hand if you're willing to be a reader. Um, we'd love to have like three people if it's possible. So the journalists write. After the cops showed up in an urban forest and detained 22-year-old Manisha Dende, one of them asked her, what is this fashion of protesting for the environment? It isn't fashion, Dende snapped back. It is my duty to save trees. She was opposing plans to cut down 2,700 trees in order to build a metro train car shed on tribal land in Mumbai, India. That moment galvanized her. And now she is aiming to work with marginalized communities across her state to stop or at least reshape development projects that would harm the environment. We don't respect anyone more than we respect nature, Dende said. I'm gonna leave this up for about 10 seconds in case folks are writing down any of those words and phrases that stand out with information, emotion, or sound um, that you wanna capture. For me right now, that moment galvanized her is kind of standing out <laughs> or just the word galvanized. Right. Again, if anybody wants to be a volunteer reader, feel free to throw your name into the chat, but I'm not gonna call on folks. So I'll keep going for now. Dindy is part of a surge of young environmentalists determined to stave off climate change by challenging the destructive ways of their elders. In Uganda, a climate activist who once worked in her family's battery supply shop has found international fame for bringing Africa and the Global South into the conversation. In Scotland, a woman who quit college to warn of rising temperatures and a troubling carbon footprint is battling politicians and corporations she accuses of attempting to co-opt and distort the climate change movement. All three are part of the first generation to come of age at a time when the effects of of the climate crisis are already being felt, foreshadowing a perilous future. Give us another 10 seconds here. Thank you so much, Petra, for volunteering to read, if you don't mind doing this slide. You're still on mute, sorry. <laughs> All right. The planet is warming. The animals are disappearing. The rivers are dying and all our plants don't flower like they did before. Um, taxi Sire, a 24 year old indigenous climate activist from the Brazilian Amazon told world leaders at the United Nations the earth is speaking. She tells us that we have no more time. By any measure, the outlook is grim. Oceans are hotter than they've ever been, and the rate of sea level rise has doubled since 2006. Carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere haven't been this high in two million years. More than one million plants and animal species are at risk of extinction. The impact will be most profound for the young in poorer countries. Thank you for that beautiful reading. Leave this up for a few seconds. Right, last one. It's not the devastation that keeps us fighting. It's what we see in our minds, the vision, the hope, said Vanessa Nakate, an activist from Uganda. Scottish activist Lauren McDonald says her mental health has suffered, both from anguish about the, ir the irreversibly changing world and the feeling that she must carry more of that weight as others look away. 
we need more people to be taking on this burden, to share it between people, McDonald said. She does the work for her little sister. I want to do everything that I can to mitigate like devastation for the people that I love, she said. I think that it's so important to have the audacity to keep trying. A few seconds here. And of course, this is a much longer story. Um, it's profiling, as you can start to see here, profiling young activists in different parts of the world um, who are working on climate issues. But just with the four short excerpts that we've been able to look at together, I wanna ask you to think about this question. What is the feeling of this story? And I think as somebody who works in a journalism organization, right? Um, I think that we don't ask this question enough of the kinds of like news stories that we encounter on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, we think about like, we think about information as a primary purpose of journalism and emotion as a secondary purpose. Whereas the roles are kind of reversed in poetry. Poems can give us information about what's going on in the world, but emotion comes first in them. So using them together is an opportunity for us to really be informed about the things that are going on in the world, but also in touch with our feelings about them because our feelings are why journalists write in the first place. They're the only reason why we're looking at these news stories because we have empathy, because we are impacted by these things, because we feel connected to them. Um, so we want in these conversations um, and as we start to explore news stories, to think about how for the purpose of this contest, we can tap into those emotions and put them at the forefront of the work that we're doing. So I wanna ask you what feelings you personally experience when you're exploring this news story or what feelings you imagine the people featured in this news story, those young activists who we were just meeting might be experiencing themselves. So I invite you to share words or phrases in the chat um, it could just be one word that comes to mind for you in answer to either of these questions or to come off mute and share. Janelle says hope. Miguel says resilience. Petra says, urgency and devastation. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Essie's pulling out a couple of phrases that like contain some of those feeling words too, right? Um, and mm -hmm. helpful for if, if students are answering that second question, right? And especially if they wind up writing from the perspective of somebody else to be able to point to evidence in that story and direct voices from that story as opposed to just pure conjecture about how somebody might feel, right? Um, so Essie's noting the phrases, anguish about the irreversibly changing world. So there's anguish here and the feeling that she must carry more of the weight as others look away. So some of that heaviness as well. And I think important for us here to look at the range that we have um, in the chat, just from a few folks sharing for a few um, re and reflecting for a few seconds here, that we have everything from hope to resilient, hope and resilience on one side, um, to devastation and anguish on the other, that urgency kind of in between there. Um, I think there's also a lot of anger in this story. Um, there, there are a lot of feelings um, and all of them are contained in this story. All of them are directions in which a poem can go. Um, Amy shared somber and hopeful. Um, so, uh, so, you know, the best poems are going to be ones that preserve that kind of complexity, that this is not just an issue, whatever students ultimately choose to write about. This is not just sadness. Life is never pure sadness. Life is never pure joy, but instead um, that, uh, that we can preserve some of those nuances and sometimes the conflict um, that might be at play in an issue. Yeah, and Miguel is also noting, interesting, the other side, quote unquote, other side. 
the response of the police, of what fashion is this in opposition to their voices. And such an interesting window, right? Um, there are so many ways to approach these stories. Um, when I say what feelings do you imagine the people featured in this story might be experiencing, the first people who might come to mind are the activists because we see them the most in this story, but there are other people who are involved um, in this story in many different ways. And looking at different perspectives, I think is a really useful thing to do um, to uh, to challenge the way that we might be thinking about the story and um, to, to give us uh, a new window in. So I wanna step back from this specific story for a moment and ask you a general question about the news that you tend to encounter on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, out of curiosity, like what's your first reaction to this question? Is most of the news that you hear about positive, negative, or something else somewhere in between those two things? Hold about five seconds. Go ahead and get those responses in. Okay, um, we have 100% negative responses here, right? Um, and, uh, you know, occasionally um, in a class, students will tell me I'm getting like mostly positive news and I'm like, please tell me what your sources are. I love that, <laughs> um, but it's unusual. Uh, other and in between um, might be the case. Maybe like news can't, news is not all bad, of course, but like often those headlines are overwhelming because journalists tend to see it as their job to tell us about the problems that are facing the world. It's really important work to do, but it does mean um, that those kinds of statistics that we saw at the beginning um, affect us all, that, uh, that many of us are feeling um, disengaged from news or that we might be feeling sad, angry, um, afraid as a result of the kinds of headlines that we're encountering on a day-to-day -day basis. So one of the questions of fighting words um, is how we can dig into and tap into our real emotions about the stories that we're encountering on a day-to-day -day basis, but instead of disengaging with that news that is important and is affecting us and affecting other people around the world, use those feelings to do something that is generative, both for ourselves to help us process how we're feeling about it, and also for others uh, to share that information with more people, offer more perspective on it. So um, that is where we might turn toward the writing process. Um, I would love if folks would be willing to spend a moment looking back at your list and sharing one favorite phrase that you wrote down while exploring that news story. Um, and again, you know, this is a revision process. Uh, this is a screenshot of um, one of the graphic organizers that's available on our website that asks you to form that like word and phrase bank. And then step one is to fill it while you're reading your news story. Step two is to go back and highlight or cross out um, phrases that you do and don't want to use um, based on what's really jumping out to you, what the crux of this story seems to be. Any phrases folks want to share? I know that Essie already shared a couple that she wrote down as um, ones that kind of captured uh, the feeling of the story, um, the feeling that she must carry more of that weight as others look away, for example. Naomi shared, the earth is speaking. I love that. It almost kind of sounds like a refrain to me. I think there's a lot of tension of like what used to be and what could be. So I liked playing with the words marginalized versus galvanized or um, like there was that phrase, uh, oh, it was the flowers, they don't bloom, but like they did before and then just keep trying. I, I like the, the tension that happens in the, the poem. I love that. And I also love like the, the little sound play that there is with marginalized and galvanized. Absolutely. Amy shared, we don't respect anyone more than we respect nature. I love that. And I especially love, um, I think it depends on the kind of poem that you're writing, right? Um, but uh, frequently it's really useful um, to include 
direct quotes um, from the the people who are most affected, right? Um, uh, depending on you know the approach that you're taking, sometimes students are more subversive. Um, but uh, but yeah, I, I love that you chose a, a quote from one of the activists, Amy. Miguel chose, what is this fashion of protesting for the environment? Yeah, absolutely. That that line from the opposition, right? Um, yeah, I think if we're talking about tension here, right? Um, that's a great place to go to seek out some of those tensions in this story. Petra shared, it isn't fashion, foreshadowing, mitigate the devastation. Um, really important, right? Uh, that one single word, if it is like a distinctive enough word, um, is also a, a way to draw out um, words and phrases for this contest. Um, Janelle, do you mind sharing about the number? Uh, I think that numbers are so, there's so much opportunity in numbers. So if you have a number like this and then you could break it down or or draw an image in their mind what 2,700 um, trees would be like or what 2,700 of anything else might mean, um, yeah, my kids like to play with numbers, so. I love that, absolutely. Um, some of my very favorite uh, fighting words poems have like prominently featured numbers. Um, I, I think the information one, uh, like the standout information sometimes gets lost in the mix as we look for like beautiful words and phrases um, the first time around, which is why I'd always encourage a student and I mean myself as well, right? To read a story multiple times if we're really trying to process both our feelings about it and the information here. Um, so yeah, I, I love it when um, when like a fact is kind of at the core of um, a poem that somebody's working with. Thank you so much for sharing these. Um, and honestly, every single one of the phrases that you shared would make a beautiful base for a poem, um, even just as a single like word or phrase um, from the chat here. And what I also love is that any one of those choices would result in a deeply different poem, depending on which direction you went in, not only because of your own personal voice and perspective, but also because um, those, those phrases come from different perspectives already within the story. Um, so thank you so much for sharing them and beginning that kind of exercise of what it looks like to read through a story closely with attention to its language and its information and our own feelings about it all at the same time and um, really value our emotional responses to them. So as a final um, element of our workshop today, I wanna share with you um, the example of uh, Charlie Johnson's poem. Um, when Charlie was a finalist for Fighting Words, they were um, a, uh, a rising sophomore, so a ninth grade student in Carborough, North Carolina. And they chose this, uh, this story because they were personally really passionate about climate change and the environment. And of course, um, there are many different poems that you could write in response um, to, uh, to the story that we just explored. And um, we'll just take a look at Charlie's as an example of what it looked like uh, for them to respond. Is there anybody who would, um, sometimes we have uh, recordings that students voluntarily send us of themselves reading the poems, but Charlie opted not to do that for their poem. Um, is there anyone who would like to read this aloud for us? I can do it if no one else wants to. Thank you, Janelle. <laughs> uh -huh. Stunned by your blatant oblivion and numbed into frigid trepidation. By the icy fist of terror, frozen in place, I await the storm. Our plants don't flower like they did before. She's a mere child, right? A callow girl, too young to care. But you wash your withered palms of responsibility and await the buzzards. So whose problem is it now? Our plants don't flower like they did before. Who is it? Who is to help her shoulder this burden? If when she calls, it is on willingly deaf. If when she calls, it is on willingly deaf ears. If when she tries to find a resuscitative breath, she looks to blackened lungs. Our plants don't flower like they did before. Falsely deemed safe, 
this volatile soil quivers, prepares for collapse beneath our souls. No matter how much you deny that it's a problem, it doesn't change the fact that our plants don't flower like they did before. Thank you so much, Janelle. I'm sending you some snaps for an excellent reading and also some snaps to Charlie, um, who uh, by now should be in 12th grade, I believe. Um, um, so very happy senior year to them. Yes, and thank you for the celebrations in the chat. I <laughs> appreciate you all. And I wanna ask you about this poem, you know, um, I, I think that um, if we were doing this uh, in a class of students, right, um, we might just ask, like, if this were, if Charlie were one of your peers, um, how would you review this poem, right? What is, what, what are they doing well? What could they do better? Um, but for, uh, for now, for our time together, um, this is one of the more straightforward inclusions of, um, of uh, lines from a news story that you might find in the Fighting Words poems. Um, it's just a refrain, a single line that is really powerful that repeats several times. Other students will choose to integrate short lines and phrases throughout their poems. There are many different ways to do this successfully. But I would love to hear um, from a couple of folks out loud or in the chat, what did you like about Charlie's poem? Um, any lines that particularly stood out to you here? Um, what are they doing well? Mm. Janelle says, I love how they chose to use the real estate of each line. Absolutely. Um, I, that's something that I noticed, uh, Janelle, in your um, in your uh, worksheet um, or, you know, your, your guide, your document for students that um, there's a lot of intentionality around how students use space in their poems and occupy that space. Um, so Charlie's definitely taking those kinds of lessons to heart here, um, thinking intentionally about indenting and the line length. Miguel says, I found this one line really strong. If when she tries to find a resuscitative breath, she looks to blackened lungs. Yeah. Totally agree. And I also just love a question in a poem. <laughs> like you don't have to resolve it for us. I love that. <laughs> Mm. And Amy says, um, maybe an echo of like the real estate, the spacing here. I appreciate how the final phrase is organized word by word, line by line. Um, and when we think about the emotions of this poem, right, um, I am I am definitely reminded of many things that folks shared here before. Um, I am reminded of, uh, of like the weight that Essie shared. Um, but uh, with Amy's comment here, that line by line ending, I can almost feel like, I can feel the urgency um, that Petra noted. I can also feel some exasperation that's coming through to me, right, in, in some of this poem. Petra says, I love the positioning of contrast. Do you want to say any more about that? The re that repeating line, um... I have to turn my phone <laughs> so I can read it. <laughs> Our plants don't flower like they did before. It's it it's just that while it's sharp, it's still just subtly saying we've lost it. But then all before it's 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 painting this picture: frigid trepidation, icy fist, terror frozen. But our plants don't flower like they did before. And then, you know, so you know, each each group of of um phrases has something powerful to say. And then this sort of neutral, it's almost like, you know, it's almost like taking the rug out from under you, you know, the plants don't flower like they did before. But then we have these sharp images. So it's this contrasting of, you know, these sharp and then this this neutral line, but the neutral line almost slaps you. <laughs> it almost slaps you into reality that, and this is what's really there, that we don't, we've lost so much. Hmm. Powerful. Yeah, it's great. Wow. Thank you so much for for sharing that. <laughs> slaps you into reality is like a very good concise summation of this poem for me. 
Um, I feel that. And um, Essie, did you want to share your comment or any more about that? Sure. Um, yeah, I really felt like she wrote what I would have written uh, or what, what my heart would have wanted to write. And that's what's so kind of touching and haunting about it. Um, because I wrote down that phrase actually in my list of phrases as well. And I love that she opens with the, the sense of frigid trepidation because I resonate with a lot of that. She's describing kind of almost both sides, both the, the people who can't stand to look at climate change and look away and the people who aren't looking away. Both sides experience this kind of frozen terror. At least that's how I'm taking it. And it, it kind of articulates my own discomfort with looking too closely at this, uh, at climate change. So yeah, I just, it's so powerful. It's amazing. Mm. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, and thank you all for these reflections on the poem, right? Um, again, you know, something that I always emphasize to students before moving on from evaluating any student poem, right, is that the point is not to write like Charlie. The point is to write like yourself. This is just one model for what it can look like. Um, and many of you also noted a lot of um, hope and uh, and resilience in that story as well. There's another poem inside that element of the story. Um, there, there are many poems that could be written um, from a big issue like uh, climate and the environment and youth activism around it. Um, but I love uh, I love the things that you've shared about this um, and. Uh, I think just spending a little bit of time with truly any of the contest winning poems from the last six years um, will uh, will generate a lot of interesting discussion um, where with about how students do and don't resonate uh, with the kind of um, perspectives that are shared in these poems. So um, that's another story that we could have explored today. <laughs> um, so I know that we're uh, coming up on time here. And um, just to close us out, a reminder that I hope that you'll check out more of these student voices, whether you're looking to write poems yourself um, and want some inspiration from young people who are really deeply engaged with uh, different global issues and with their communities. Today, we've looked at one high school student's poem and heard from a high school teacher, but uh, students um, facilitated this workshop for students um, in the second grade before. We've had third grade winners um, all the way through 12th grade and, um, and adults participate in workshops as well, um, although the, the contest specifically is open to grades K through 12. These are just a few of the faces of the students uh, who have won the contest um, in, the last, uh, in the last few years and all of their ones available on our website. So um, if you have questions, uh, I can hang on for a couple minutes after this, but I am also available um, uh, at, at my email, which I'll throw into the chat and more than happy to talk to you about any work that you're doing around fighting words. Um, truly one of my favorite projects uh, every year. And I hope that you will uh, let us know if there's anything that we can do to support you, as well as share your feedback on this workshop and the program more broadly to help us improve our education programs around, um, around this work. Um, so thank you all so much for taking time out of your days to be with us and to talk about underreported stories, global issues, and how we can use poetry to process and amplify those things. Again, um, a huge thank you to Essie and to the Institute for Regional and International Studies National Resource Center, uh, which supports and enhances global awareness and inspires informed thinking about the complexities of our world. Um, they also provide resources and expertise to K-12 and post-secondary educators, students, and the community at large. And, are so, and we are so grateful at the Pulitzer Center to have gotten to partner with them on a few of these workshops and hope to get to do so in the future too. So thank you folks so much. Um, I am uh, here if you have any questions, but um, otherwise, uh, thank you. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Take care. <laughs>